We want to welcome you to our Easter morning worship service here at the Southern Hope Church of Christ. Uh, as a reminder of what we're actually celebrating today, we want to read a passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 3. For what I received, I pass on you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, and to all the apostles, and last of all appeared to me as one abnormally born. Today we have gathered together to worship. I want to remind you that we will have our communion service as part of this, but if at all possible, at 1145, even if you haven't gotten to the communion service, please take your communion at 1145 so we can do this as a church family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. God, as we just go into this time of your service, we pray your blessing be upon us that we would worship you in a way that's pleasing in your sight, and that you would bless our praise to you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Again, that's Revelation chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals? And open the scroll! No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out to all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They say, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. The elders fell down. Worship. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to, to study your word, to do it freely. And God, we just pray your blessing be upon us, to strengthen us, encourage us, and help us understand what your word is truly trying to tell us. So God, please be with us in this time of study and help us to know your word. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Today we're opening up in the book of Revelation. It may sound like a strange place to go, but the book of Revelation is all about a celebration. And in this book, we have this celebration at the very early parts of the book. And just like the book of Revelation, we come today to celebrate the risen Lamb. See, as we look at this passage today, we see this Lamb who is there opening this scroll. And this Lamb, it was said, looked as if it had been slain. This lamb is Jesus Christ. The lamb that was slain on a cross but raised to life on that Sunday morning. And this is our reminder about God. Jesus rose from the dead. Our God still lives. And we have a celebration today. Well, we want to wrestle with this question for a little bit today. What does it really mean in our lives? What kind of impact does it have to say that our God lives? That we worship the living God. Our lives are, impact, our lives are impacted by the statement that God's not dead. Well, what does it mean for us? Let's start with Christ. Since this is Resurrection Sunday, we're talking about the resurrection. Let's start with Him and ask the question, what does it mean that our Christ still lives. As the old song starts off, because he lives. At the heart of the gospel is the fact of the resurrection. In the first Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul goes into the most detail about the importance of the resurrection of any passage in the scriptures. And at the heart of this, he opens up this, this statement about the resurrection like this. First Corinthians chapter 15, start with verse 3. For I received, I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom were still living, though some had fallen asleep. They appeared to James, 
And to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. As Paul is talking about the, the heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, he puts right in here that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an essential doctrine. It is at the heart of everything that there is about Christianity. What does that mean for us? His resurrection means that we will have a resurrection. That's why it's so important for us. The fact that we're celebrating today that He lives. That our God's not dead. We are celebrating the fact that not only did He raise from the dead, but so will we. Now how, do we, how are we so sure about this promise? How are we so sure about that statement? Well, there's at least three different passages of Scripture I want us to take a look at. First one, number one, John chapter 14, start with verse 1. John chapter 14, start with verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus makes a promise here with the apostles that still applies to us today that Jesus has gone on to heaven. And when he comes back, he is taking us where he is. He would tell his apostles, in his Father's house are many rooms. He is preparing a place for you and for me, for all Christians. Number two, our, bapti our baptism is a reminder of our resurrection. Our baptism is a reminder of our resurrection. Romans chapter 6, start with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin, how can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have lived a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self is crucified with him so that the body of sin may be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. When we are faithful to God's commandment to repent and be baptized, baptism is a reminder of our own resurrection. Just as we were raised out of that watery grave, we will be raised out of the grave in this world. Our baptism is connected with a promise of a resurrection. And God never lies. And when he makes a promise, we know that it is true. You see, this is what our hope is built on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13-18 Paul gives a smaller talk about the importance of the resurrection and, and its essentialness. It's a reminder to us as Christians that no matter what else is going on in this world, we have hope because of the resurrection. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left in the coming of the Lord, will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left with them will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. As we look at this passage, and we look at the hope that we have in this world. It's built on one fact, and one fact only, that we know that this world is not the end. We know that even though we may die in this world, we will be resurrected to be with God. Our hope, our faith, is completely in Jesus Christ. Jesus' resurrection means that we will have eternal life. 
what we celebrate here. This is the true hope of the gospel. This is the good news. Not only have your sins been forgiven, not only have you been made right with God, not only have you been redeemed or purchased back to God, you will have eternal life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because He lives, we live. Because He lives, we have a home in heaven. Because He lives, death will not defeat us. Because He lives, we have hope in this world. But what's it mean that God still lives? There's been songs and movies with the title, God's Not Dead. And there's an important relevance behind that. Because God lives, He's still in charge. The phrase, God's dead, the phrase, God is dead, is intended to say, first of all, that there is no God. The problem with this is that we see that in the scripture the basis for wisdom is found in the belief that there is a God. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, it talks about the beginning of all knowledge. And it starts off with the statement that there is a God. Proverbs chapter 1, starting with verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Scripture also says something a little bit of the opposite. In the Psalms, the 14th Psalm, verse 1, the psalmist begins this way. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. For me, they may look at that as a harsh statement, so I want to explain it a little bit. What God means by that is, is He has given us evidence in His creation to see that He exists. Common sense tells us that if there is a creation, there has to be a creator. When somebody is denying this, this truth, they are denying what's before their very eyes. That's why the scripture says, calls them a fool. When we see this world, the complications of how the universe runs and, and how complicated the human body is, we know that there has to be a creator. We have to intentionally lie to ourselves and say that there is no God. And the reason they don't want to believe in God is they want to ignore Him. They don't want to do as He commands. They want to go their own way. We've read this over the past couple weeks, but I want to review it again. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 is telling us what the problem with mankind is. And in Romans chapter 1, it starts off very plainly about why people deny that there is a God. Romans 1, start with verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood, from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, and animals, and reptiles. The, the slogan that's been popular for so many years, that God's, God is dead, is basically saying, I don't want God to rule in my life, so I have to deny what's out there in order to justify my deeds. They're not trying to really come up with wisdom. They're just trying to deny so that they can live the way they want to live. They can make themselves God. But as we continue on with the study, we see, however, God is eternal and truly cannot die. God is eternal. He has lived. He always will live. He is the creator. He, he started before time. God has no beginning. He has no end. He is the only true being who has an eternity past, which means he always existed, and an eternity future. 
Sure, when we go to heaven, we will live forever. We have an eternity future, but we had a beginning. We had a start. We did not have a beginning in the past. God always existed. We have an eternity future. We didn't have an eternity past. God did. God is the only being who is truly an eternal being. So how do we know that God still lives? Somebody may be asking themselves that question and we're, we're dancing around it. First of all, we go back to his nature. It is his nature. Being an eternal being, we know that since his nature says he is eternal, he is an eternal being. He still lives. He cannot die. But if you want a little bit of evidence, this is the evidence. The earth and the universe keep functioning. Everything that we own has to be maintained. The house that you're sitting and watching this right now has to be maintained. Maybe the automobile that you drove today has to be maintained. The computer or the phone that you're watching this off of has to be maintained. And this earth only functions the way it's supposed to if somebody is maintaining it. And when we look at how creation is working, we see God's hand in it. Acts chapter 14, verse 17. Acts chapter 14, verse 17. He has not let himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provided you with plenty of food, fills your hearts with joy. The fact that God still gives us sunshine and oxygen, rain, growth in the ground, keeps the earth rotated, keeps the sun turned on, is evidence that he still lives. Because without a God, this could all stop at any time. Since God lives, it is our duty to worship. It is our duty to love, worship, and obey Him. Mankind was made by God, and we owe Him our existence. That means we owe Him our worship. God gave us life, and He's given us eternal life. That means we owe Him our love. Since God is King of kings, Lord of lords, since He is the Creator Almighty, we owe Him our obedience. If we don't give him all three, love, worship, and obedience, we are sinning and not treating God with the respect he is due. Because he lives, he deserves all three. Well, does this make a difference? There's plenty of religions out there. Our God lives, but the idols are dead. Satan produces false alternatives to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Start with verse 18. First Corinthians chapter 10. Start with verse 18. Consider the people of Israel. They do not um, consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do not mean that a sacrifice to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I want you to be. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons too. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? Satan wants to give us something false. He wants us to get an alternative to the true God. Anytime we worship anything that is not God, we are worshiping and following Satan and his destruction. The idols are images from the imagination of man, and they are dead. The idols that people worship are from the imagination of mankind, and they're dead. They're ne they never were living. They always were dead. Acts chapter 17, start with verse 29. Acts chapter 17, start with verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold, silver, or stone, an image made by man's image, man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When we look at this passage, we see that idols are nothing but blocks of wood and stone. They come from the imagination of man. See, either you will be made in the image of God or you will make a God in your image. 
The false gods are dead. They were never alive. You're praying to a tree. You're praying to a block of wood. You are praying to a rock. And none of those can help you. Those idols are dead. And the fate of these dead gods, these dead gods is hell. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan, the beings who are helping him out, the false prophets of this world, they all have one faith. They follow a false god, and they will receive Satan's punishment. The wood today burns in the fire, and the idol that it was created of goes into hell as well, to burn for all of eternity. We have a choice. You see, we can either seek the dead gods that have no power, or the true living God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do not seek dead gods, but the one true living God in this world. And today as we look at the sermon, we see that Jesus Christ did not stay in the grave, he is alive, which means we have life today. We see that our God is still alive, which means we owe him our allegiance today. And we see that these false gods out there are really dead gods. They have no hope, no reassurance. And today, as in every day, you have an opportunity to make a choice. Since our God lives, and this is a fact, you have a choice. How will the fact that God lives change your life? How will the fact that God lives impact your thinking? How will the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead will change your life today? Change is needed. Today, that if you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son living God, if you repent of your sins and has turned away from him, if you will confess your sins and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, be baptized for forgiveness of your sins by immersion in water and for the gift of the Holy Spirit, you can have that forgiveness. I know we can't have a call here at the physical building, but if you're watching this online and you want to make a decision, you can message us, you can email us, shccpreacher at gmail.com. You can contact us through the messages on YouTube or Facebook, and we will help you make that decision. The most important decision you'll ever make, to follow the one true living God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, help us to make this decision. Help us to do what is wise and pleasing in your sight. So God, please strengthen us to do your work and your will. And please help us to choose you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
At this time, we're going to start to participate in communion. Uh, we're hoping that uh, you have uh, been with us as we try to uh, observe communion at 11.45. If by any chance that you're watching this and you've already had communion, just stay with us for the meditation or uh, just pause the video to be able to take it at the right time. I want us to go into the first sermon, the first gospel sermon in the New Testament when the apostles preached the good news. And this is what we see. Acts chapter 2, start with verse 29. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb and is still here to this day. But he was a prophet, knew that God had promised him on oath that he had placed one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. He was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God raised his Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of the fact. He exalted to the right hand of God. He, was, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit has poured out from what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit my right hand until I make your enemies footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In the gospel message, Paul, or excuse me, in the gospel message here, Peter is reminding us, yes, Jesus did die on the cross. And the influence of the Lord's Supper remind us of that. That his, the, the bread reminds us of his flesh that was nailed to the cross. The, the cup reminds us of the blood that was poured out for us. But he also reminds us that our God raised Jesus from the dead. This is different than any of the other resurrections that happened in Scripture. The other resurrections, a prophet or a righteous man or the Son of God or an apostle would come and it would touch the person or would call out to them, but on that day 2,000 years ago, Christ exited that tomb on his own. No prophet had to come yell for him. Nobody had to go touch him. He arose. And when we come to this communion service, we are reminded not only of the cross of Jesus Christ, but of the resurrection, the empty tomb. We are proclaiming his death until he returns. We are making a statement, a statement that says, that our Savior is coming back for His church. It's the time we have this united testimony as a church and as a group and as Christians and as individuals. At this time, we're going to ask that you please remember this death, this burial, and this resurrection, and the return that is coming. And then we pray to God to forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. And as a family, if you have kids, you can always remind them that they participate by praying to God about their lives Praying to God about what sins they're sorry for and how they want to do better and thanking God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to have them think about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ while we partake. At this time, we're going to bless this moment and after the prayer, if you want to record a video, or pause the video, we will go right into our communion service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. God, we just pray right now that you please forgive us for where we have sinned and failed you. Please give us that uh, encouragement we need to remember the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Forgive us for our sins, and please strengthen us today. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. At this time, we're going to go into our, our offering portion. Um, if uh, you have offering, you can still mail it in to us. We are checking that, and we will take the, any offerings that you do send. But we want at this point to uh, remember that offering is an element of our worship. It's not just something sometimes I hear people when they do communion medita or offering meditation skip and say, well, it's to keep the lights on, it's to pay the preacher. No, actually, offering is a moment of worship. A moment of worship, just like communion, is a moment of worship. A moment of worship, just like the music part, is a moment of worship. A, like prayer is part of the worship, or that anything else that we do in a Sunday service is part of the worship. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul reminds the Corinthian church, not to neglect this time. Now about the collection for God's people. Do I told the Galatian churches to do on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money, keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. Everybody's income is a little bit different. Everybody's best is a little bit different. Whatever it is that God has blessed you with, 
Maybe a lot, maybe a little. Just don't forget to remember Him during this time of the service. And we will pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you have given us. God, we just pray that as we come into this time of the service, that you please bless whatever it is that we have given you to be used for your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.